I was in the MTC before the age change, and so I was nine weeks in the MTC learning Romanian. And so I was ready to get out there, ready to get learned, and I felt like I had the language down perfectly. It could be not perfect, but I felt like I could do pretty well. Then I get out there, and I'm afraid to talk to anyone, whether it be on the airplane, whether it be anywhere else. And I was just, I was frightened, like, my MTC district was me and two sisters, and that was it. And so... On the airplane over there, they were talking to everyone, having a great time, and doing what they could to spread the gospel, and I couldn't talk to anyone. Um, it was kind of frightening to me, and then we get out into the country, and there were actual Romanians there, clammed right up, couldn't talk at all. Um, which, it was kind of, it was really difficult for me, because I wanted to say things, but I couldn't. And we even went to the park to do stuff like that, and still nothing. Um, and that was actually kind of something that it was very stressful for me, um, learning because the language I felt like I had pretty well down, but I didn't trust myself enough with it to try it, um, which eventually I, I overcame. And I mean, everyone does, and I feel like most people do go through that kind of stressful situation. Um, my trainer actually told me, I asked him, "Well, how long did it take you to get to that point?" And he told me. So let's say you have a bucket of paint, white paint, right? And you add a little tiny drop of green coloring into it and stir it. And you keep doing that and keep doing that. At what point does the paint turn green? And like obviously there's no like distinct line when you can say that it's green. I mean, you could, I guess, make a scientific one, but it's something that comes slowly. And you have a realization moment that, oh, I do speak this language. And it was really kind of an interesting thing. It was when I was a senior companion, actually. Um, and I could understand everything that the person was talking about. And my companion was in a second transfer, had no idea. And I was able to have a really good conversation. And so it's kind of, it was a, a really, it, I feel like most people, if not all of them, will reach that moment where you realize you speak the language. It'll take a while, but it was... I I'd remember that pretty well. The water there isn't terribly great, and the church doesn't try, like the church has certain filters we have to get for it. And funnily enough, like they had water filters, and I thought, well, how am I supposed to shower with the filtered water comes out so slow? We didn't need to worry about that at all. That we you can shower in the normal water, but I thought you had to get filtered water and like store it up and heat it up yourself. I don't know. Um, that was a pretty fun one. And then also my first night, I remember we started doing missionary work, like out in the field, just like start going on the street and talking to people. And it was like, I was with two people that I wasn't actually supposed to, it was kind of a complicated thing. And so they weren't prepared to do it. So they just went out and talked to everyone and weren't exactly prepared to do that. But at least I thought so anyways, it was years ago that this happened. But they could talk so well, and I thought, I don't know if I'll ever make it to that point. <laughs> it was really frightening, it really was. The Romania-Moldova mission is two countries, Romania and Moldova, um, with the mission headquarters in Bucharest. Um, there are two languages spoken there. There used to be three. There used to have Hungarian as well. But they switched it all to strictly Romanian and Russian, to my knowledge, at least anyways. Um, and if you're called Russian speaking, you're only in Moldova, where you serve there in one of like three cities. So that's kind of a small mission form because Moldova is a tiny country in and of itself. Um, but Romanian missionaries can go either in Romania or Moldova because in Moldova they speak both Romanian and Russian. Like I think it was about beginning of 1900s, like there was one, a couple of missionaries that went there and preached the gospel and had some converts. And then what happened was communism came and invaded Romania and all the church was kicked out of Romania. And that was a hard time for everyone because I mean, religion wasn't allowed, but somehow uh, Romanian orthodoxy survived through it. Um, but once communism fell, I think it was like a, sometime within the first year or two, 
uh, missionaries were sent immediately in there and started working. Um, it was a fusion of another mission that was right next to it. I think it was Bulgaria, but I'm not certain about that. Um, and so some of their missionaries went up there to teach and they had some success, a lot of success actually, and it started growing. Um, at the current moment, well, there are, I believe there are three districts um, with four chapels. Yeah, four chapels um, in all of Romania and Moldova with different um, rented out building houses as well. Uh, I'm not sure how strong the what the church membership numbers are, but there are generally at sacrament meeting there can be anywhere from five to about well the largest that I ever saw was about a hundred people in a church meeting and that was that was an amazing experience to have um, and so it's definitely not the strongest there, but the members there you will find are some of the strongest because they've been through everything. They've been through communism. They've been through the persecution of being a new member in a new country. Um, because quite frankly, like Romania is a, um, it's a very hard place for religions to thrive. And so it's great to see how the members have made it through. Um, and their faith like sometimes you'll see them pay like I was a part of a bishopric at one point and you'd see tithing and fast offerings and then a book of Mormon fund and fairly similar numbers straight through like whatever they paid for tithing they'd pay similarly to the mission fund or um, or to book of Mormons and so they don't have a lot that's for sure it's a fairly poor country but they have a lot of faith in what they do um, and I think the way that the work has been going forward has been through the members. Um, the missionaries going out and finding is great, but it's through the members bringing their friends and also being a part of the missionary experience with, um, the, with the, the missionaries, whether it be on the street contacts or whatever, the members are part of it really strengthen it because you can see their faith. And when they're a part of those lessons, it strengthens them too. I served when I was called to places I always served in Romania, but I got to visit Moldova for, I think it was two days. Um, but there are a couple of cities. I generally served in bigger cities like Ploiesht, and then I went to Craiova, back to Ploiesht, and then, well, saying these names might not be important, but Deva, Cluj, Bucharest, Yash, and then back to Craiova. And I traveled around a lot on the mission. I don't know if that was, I, I feel like it probably wasn't as common, at least back then, for me to move around as much. I was probably an oddball. <laughs> but I got to see a lot of the mission. And I spent about half my mission in the section called Transylvania, which most people have heard of. Um, beautiful mountainous region. Um, very, very great people. And it's just so great to serve in there. And that's where a lot of Hungarians are as well. Um, because there's a big dispute between Romania and Hungary about that area. And so I got to teach some Hungarians. And sometimes communication was a bit different because their native tongue was Hungarian and I, I knew Romanian. So a lot of times the language barrier was difficult in that regard because we were both translating to another language. Um, but I did serve in a lot of... Uh, I'd served all over the country and I felt like I got a pretty good um, view of the country and the beauty of it actually. The mountainous areas are so great and then there's some, um, well Craiova is kind of flat area but you can see throughout everything and look at the sky. Great thunder and lightning storms there. I really enjoyed it. So my first city was Ploiesht and everyone would tell me that it's not exactly the best looking of cities. Um, if you know anything about uh, history, it was bombed during World War II, I believe, because it was a giant oil field. Like that's, you can walk in there and if you know what oil smells like, I don't, I've heard that it smells like that. And it's just, it smells like oil. Um, and it still is, I, I'm not sure if the, the refineries or the drilling is still happening there, but that's part of it. And it's not the best looking city, but it is one of my favorites. It was, it was a pretty big, a nice city. It was very industrialized with communist blocks is what we call, oh, we call them blocks. They're just giant cement buildings 
that would be anywhere from three floors to I'd say 10 or so. And then you just stuff as many different apartments as you can into one of these blocks. Um, which is kind of interesting if you could get into one because they have like a little passcode on the side that you either put the pin in or you have a key or you intercom in. Um, and if you have any one of those, then you can get in and then knock on all the doors if you're a missionary. Um, a lot of times I tried to avoid the blocks because it wasn't always, it wasn't my favorite thing to do. I liked being outside and being able to work with people. And sometimes it did give good success, sometimes not. It all depends upon the area, even sometimes which neighborhood you were in. Um, but public transit was a big thing there. There's all sorts of um, buses, tons of buses, whether they be the electric ones or normal gas ones. There's a very good, well-developed bus system there. You just get an abonnement, uh, a monthly pass, basically, to get you to travel throughout the whole city. Well, that's really cool. Um, and then also, if you need to get somewhere really quick, you can take a taxi. And taxis are actually really cheap. It's like a dollar... A, allows about 30 cents per kilometer so it doesn't come to too much and you can get pretty far pretty quick especially in the city which is so compact um, but a lot of times uh, there I think the of the whole mission when I was there anyways only two or three sets of missionaries ever got to drive a car the assistants the office elders and an occasional zone leader and so a lot of, there was a lot of walking, a lot of public transit. Um, we'd walk everywhere. My shoes at one point um, were worn out so much and I walk a little funny. So one side of the shoe was worn out this much and then the other one was this height. So I was limping and tilting everywhere. But that was about six, six months to a year into the mission I had that problem with my shoes. So just to show how much walking there was. Um, but a lot of people are on the buses, a lot of people are on the streets. They walk everywhere, they take the buses, and it's really cool to see them out in the environment. There are a lot of great parks there too. Um, parks where people just hanging out, playing frisbee, whatever it may be, sitting on a bench, reading, whatever it may be. A lot of their culture is in the Orthodox religion, which somehow survived through communism. I think it was kind of like, the communist leaders kind of overlooked communi uh, orthodoxy still existing. Um, and you see a lot of different things of that just bred into their culture. Um, they have things like the 40-day fast where they'd not eat meat for 40 days, basically a vegan diet for 40 days. Um, and all sorts of, like every holiday has something great. They have so many holidays there. Um, there's a saint's day for basically every saint you could name under the under the sun. Um, it's kind of fun also, when you go by a church, they'll always cross themselves. And not a lot of people know why they do it, but someone was saying it's kind of like a memory of praying to God in a sense. Like, you know, I don't have time to stop and worship right now, but I want to at least let you know that you're in my thoughts. That's kind of how I perceived that. Um, seeing that actually kind of strengthened my um, my want to pray more, pray stronger and more fervently. Because if they can do it every time they see a church, I might as well do it all the time, you know? Because there are a lot of churches there. With food, I think the only thing that I can think of in etiquette is when, when someone gives you something to eat, you eat it all. Because <laughs> um, it's... I don't know, like I've, I've always been one to eat, so I haven't ever left anything left over, but they will keep giving you more. It's like, oh, we've got more. Take some more sadamali or whatever it may be. Um, and the food is like 99% of the time really, really good. And so um, I think the only thing is make sure to eat their food. Try it at least before you say that you don't like it. Because um, I had an opportunity to try something that didn't look too great. And probably wasn't my favorite thing to eat, but I was definitely glad that I'd tried it afterwards. So for holidays, actually, I can think of their two largest ones are Christmas and Easter, as the Christian religion would denote. Um, for Christmas, they spend so much time together as a family. It's really awesome. Um, 
and Easter time, the night before they have what we American missionaries called midnight mass. Um, I don't know what exactly what they'd call it, um, but the night before Easter, everyone gathers around the churches, and they have <clears throat> a mass or a service together in which um, they light this candle, which is, I believe, the tradition is that it's fire from heaven um, coming down on Easter. And so the priest or the head of the church would light a candle and then pass it to everyone. Everyone would pass their candle out. And if you made it home um, with your candle still lit, all of your sins would be forgiven is, the, is how tradition denotes. Um, but they have all these different little traditions that they'll stick with that in some ways do point them a lot towards God, which is something interesting to think about. Because um, traditions are great as long as they point us towards God. Romania has really good food. Everything from sadamale, shawarma, um, oh, what else called? There's just such good food there. Um, so a very traditional holiday food is called sadamale. And so what they do is they have either pickled or um, boiled cabbage that they then use to wrap, um, well, they call them cabbage rolls, I think, as a translation in English. And they put meat and rice and lots of different flavorings in there, roll it up in the cabbage, and then boil it, whether it be in chicken broth or tomato um, sauce, all sorts of different stuff. And then you just take that out and put some sour cream on top, and it is so good. That is like some of the best thing. You have some bread with that, and it's amazing. Um, another one of my favorite things is how very frequent bread is. Like, so a lay was worth about 30 cents, 30 American cents, and you can buy a loaf of bread for a lay basically anywhere on the street. You see all these different vendors of bread all the time. I mean, it was really good. Like, it's better than our, it's kind of like the French bread that you'd see here but it's so much better. At least my opinion, I don't know if anybody else agrees with me. And so we get a loaf of bread and get something called zakuska, which is an eggplant and tomato and all sorts of different stuff all mixed into this spread that you'd put on the bread and it was delicious. <laughs> Shawarma is another good thing. It's a, actually, I believe, a Turkish food, um, but it's kind of like um, what's the best? A euro, but it has fries in it and a special sauce and everything that sets it apart. Um, those are always good. You just grab those on the go when you're going to grab food. Um, that one's if you're hungry but don't have a lot of time to eat, you grab a nice shower and it's so good. And then probably my favorite snack to have there was, were the pretzels, Kovarich. Um, and they're like they're everywhere, super cheap, really good. And they had, they'd have everything from salt and sesame seed on the top to chocolate filled. Um, and it was really, those were things that companions I like, especially towards the end of my mission, we'd get like one a day if we could, go as frequently as we could, and enjoy the good food there. There are a lot of foods that some people will say are gross and kind of weird. Um, but I think it's just because the ingredients they use. Because they have what's called chorba de borta. I never had it personally, actually. Um, but it's actually stomach soup. And they have the stomach of a, a cow. But I've actually heard a lot of people say that it's really good. Um, and there are just a lot of different things that if you... You just got to go try it. If, they, if it's offered to you, you try it. If you don't feel... Daring enough to order at a restaurant, just wait till someone gives it to you. You might have that occasionally. Um, but I always have some pretty good desserts too. Little prachitur, just like tarts and different things. The Russians, um, it was a communist country under the Soviet Union. And so I believe everyone was forced to learn Russian or, I don't know about forced, but they learned Russian in the school system when, uh, what, during communist times. Um, but there aren't a ton of Russians in Romania, to my knowledge anyways. I never saw too many, if any at all. Um, 
And the thing is, the Romanians stuck very well to their language. They kept the language as pure as they could and actually did a really good job. Um, there is influence, uh, Russian influence, in um, a little bit in the language, like da and a couple of other random words that I can't think of. Um, but Moldova, on the other hand, is very Russian influenced. Um, because I believe everyone speaks, well, most everyone speaks Russian, and a lot of people speak Romanian there, depending upon where you live. Um, even to the extent that there's a city that the people don't know how to read the Latin alphabet, but don't speak Russian too well. So they have a Cyrillic Bible in Romanian. Um, I feel like there aren't too many tensions with Russia. I don't know. They, the older people will often say, oh, we should still have communism. The younger people are like, we need to do something better than that. And so, but I don't feel like there's too much tension in that regard. Well, for myself, I never had any instances with any people out there. One of the big things that some people have troubles with are there are a lot of dogs, lots of stray dogs. Um, and they're not a problem most of the time. They're generally pretty calm, just sitting on the grass, just waiting around, scavenging food. Um, strangely enough, the only instance that I've ever had with a bad experience on my mission that I had with a dog was with someone's um, leashed dog, where he actually got, he bit me. And I had to get shots for that, unfortunately. But the stray dogs are actually very nice most of the time. Um, I haven't had problems with them. Um, I've heard a couple of stories, like very few and rare stories about anything with knives. Um, I've heard once or twice that someone got a knife pulled on them, but they weren't going to do anything with it anyways. It was just, it was to frighten them. Um, and so it's fairly safe. I don't think I can think of, I mean, I don't know if my perspective is exactly the best. I was fairly oblivious to everything that was going on around me, but I do feel like, um, it was a pretty safe place to be a little bit dark and beaten down from communism. Um, but as long as you don't mess with the right, the wrong people, then you're generally pretty safe in there. Well, I think the big thing is follow the spirit and try and stay to the more populated areas during the nighttime. Um, it can get kind of sketchy in some places. There are, I hate to say it this way, but there are gypsy villages and there are a lot of what people would call gypsies that are great, outstanding citizens. And then there are also ones that just don't do a ton. And so when I say that, that's what I'm referring to with the gypsies, um, that their situation has just been hard and they never even learned to read because of their growth, which causes them to get married at a young age and then um, not have their kids learn to read and it's just a bad cycle. But trying to avoid those places at night, the place with a lot of the sketchy gypsies, but I feel like those are kind of areas you kind of should realize that it's kind of a bad place to be in. Um, but during the nighttime or whenever it's dark, stay where it's well lit and you should be really fine. I didn't realize how cheap it was until I came back and started looking for like married housing and that kind of thing. But it actually is really cheap there. You could go for, um, I had to do a decent amount of apartment hunting just because we moved around in the places that I was at. But I think most places would go for about a couple hundred euro, which is a couple hundred dollars, um, for apartments. And that's how they'd pay for apartments is with euros. Um, which is fair, about one to one rate for um, American dollars. And then food was actually, everything else was really cheap. Um, when I was there, 900 lei, which is about $300, was what we'd get each month for everything that we needed. Um, the church would pay, or the, the mission office would pay for housing and utilities and that kind of thing. Um, so all we had to do was worry about transportation and food. And so with transportation, um, a bus pass would probably go for about what would be $30 for the whole month, so about 100 lei. Um, and then you'd have most of the rest of it for train rides, whichever you'd need to get from other cities if you needed to go. Or 
for food. And you could actually do quite a lot with the money that you had. Um, bread was really cheap. And there are a lot of different things you could just buy and stock up on food really easily. Um, a good lunch, as I was saying earlier, the shawarma. Um, that one costs about 10 lice. That's three bucks for a wrap, I guess. And it's generally really large and very filling. So that'll get you a full meal. Um, or you'll go to a restaurant and get a uh, menu zile. So the, the special of the day, I guess, is what it would be. Um, and that would probably cost around 10 lei, 10 to 15, which is about three to five dollars. So really good prices for really good food. One of my favorite things is obviously the people. They are very blunt and very stubborn. And so I had some person, one random day here. Uh, oh, so I met him my f first week in country and then I met him like six months later. And he told me straight up, wow, you've lost a lot of weight. You were so fat back then. And so that caught me off guard. Like, it wasn't offensive to me. But if you're fat, they'll call you fat. Um, if you have something on your face, they will tell you that. Whatever it is, they'll let you know. Um, and that's so fun about them. And they are very stubborn, which is why the members are very strong. But also kind of why the church has had a harder time growing. Um, because they stick to their old traditions, you know. Born Orthodox, raised in Orthodox, die in Orthodox. But I, I think stubborn in a very good way because you can see a lot of their faithfulness in what they do. And if they set their mind to something, they will keep through with it. Well, a lot of times when they don't want to talk to you, they won't talk to you. Which is good, actually. That means you avoid the conversations that you're not going to get anywhere with anyway. I feel like here in America, people are going to be like, or they'll listen to you or whatever and not care and then just not set up or anything. And so you waste time on that. And so it's kind of cool to see them just blatantly be out there. Um, also, if you get to know them pretty well, they'll be very loyal to you. Um, like the members there love the missionaries. I think that's one of the cool things. And they're, they, if you can get into their friend zone, which can be pretty difficult sometimes, because communism did do a lot to to harden them, I feel, to other to not trust people sometimes. But once you get into their friendship zone, they will trust you forever and they will love you. Um, and I've seen that with various different accounts, whether it be random investigators or or just people that I've um, members or people that I've gotten to know on, on the streets. They will love you. So Romanian is actually a Latin language, so one of the Romance languages. And from what I've heard is that it's the closest to Latin of them all. Um, I've found that it's very close to Italian. Um, I can understand a decent amount of Spanish, a little bit of Portuguese, and no French. <laughs> but if it's reading, I can kind of understand reading French. So they're, they're all kind of similar in that regard. Um, a beautiful language, one of my favorites, and it does have some Russian influences to it because you know the word for yes is da instead of what you see in like Spanish as C si or um, French we. Oui. Um, so there are differences in Russian influences to it. Um, I've been told my accent is actually fairly Russian for some reason. I never understood that one, but it is a fairly difficult language, I would say. But if you put the time into it, it's 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 a lot of very um, the rules are stuck to pretty well. So like the grammar rules that they teach you in the MTC and wherever you learn in grammar books, those will stick like they're most of the time fairly accurate as opposed to English, which has the weirdest of all conjugations and whatever. Um, so once you get the rules down, it's a decent enough language. Um, I do consider it probably the most beautiful language, but I'm probably biased in that regard. <laughs> so there are a couple of different letters that are in the alphabet, um, but they'll make, most of them make a noise that's fairly common to what we know. They have an S with a squiggly under it, which makes a sh noise, and then a T with a squiggly under it, which is a uh, tss noise. But then there's also what they have is, um, we'd call them A hats and I hats. And they make a sound that we can't really compare to in English. Um, it's kind of like 
they always compared in the MTC as if being punched in the stomach, the noise that you'd get, that you'd make from that, that's the noise that it makes. So it's a uh, noise right in the back of your throat. Um, and a lot of times you can't tell the difference if you're not trained to it. So it just sounds like another one of the vowels that's close to it. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to, to hear the, the differences and people trying to pronounce it when they don't know what it actually sounds like. Um, sound can actually be very difficult until you get used to it. Definitely study the grammar um, and listen to people to work on your accent. I feel like those two things are probably the best to do um, because the grammar helped me out so much. I was spending a lot of time studying and I was able to see how it worked out and though I may not have used that grammar per se, if I heard it, I knew what they were referring to. Um, and listening to people is probably the most important thing that you could ever do. Even if you don't get much missionary work from talking to people, talking to people will help you um, improve how well you speak, how well you understand, and make it so you sound more like a Romanian. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. Church. Biserica. Biserica. God. Dumnezeu. Dumnezeu. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christos. Jesus Christos. Christian. Creștin. Creștin. Missionary. Missionar, missionar. Bible, Biblia, Biblia. Book of Mormon, Cartea lui Mormon, Cartea lui Mormon. Gospel, Evangelia, Evangelia. Apostles, Apostol, Apostol. Prophets, 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 elders, vrsnich, vrsnich, sisters, suror, suror, religion, religia, religia, general conference, conferenza generala, conferenza generala. Preach my gospel. Predicat evangelia mea. Predicat evangelia mea. Faith. Credință. Credință. Repentance. Pocaință. Pocaință. Baptism. Botez. Botez. Holy Ghost. Duhul Sfânt. Duhul Sfânt. Confirmation. Confirmare. Confirmare. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Biserica lui Iisus Christos a Sfinților din zilele din urmă. Biserica lui Iisus Christos a Sfinților din zilele din urmă. Sacrament. Împarteșanie. Împarteșanie. Chapel. Capela. Capela. Prayer. Rugăciune. Rugăciune. Bishop. Episcop. Episcop. Priest. Preot. Preot. Stake president. Președinte de țăruș. Președinte de țăruș. Branch president. Președinte de ramură. Președinte de ramură. Joy. Bucurie. Bucurie. Happiness. Fericire. Fericire. Peace. Pace. Pace. Plan of salvation. Planul salvării. Planul salvării. Testimony. Mărturie. Mărturie. Hymns. Imnuri. Imnuri.
temples. Temple. Temple. Preparation day. Zi de pregătire. Zi de pregătire. Relief society. Societate de alinare. Societate de alinare. Primary. Societate primare. Societate. Societate primare. The interesting thing is, I can make a very bad Romanian accent, American accent in Romanian, but I don't know if too many people actually sound like that going into the field. Um, but I guess I can introduce myself, right? So, eu mă numesc Versnicul Hickenlooper sunt misionar de la Biserica von Isus Christos. That's kind of a, a bad accent. Um, and I'll try my best. Eu mă numesc Versnicul Hickenlooper. Eu sunt misionar de la Biserica lui Isus Christos. Well, I think my accent turned kind of Russian, but <laughs> um, it's a lot of it is focusing on what the letters, because if you read it, reading the language will give a lot. Um, if you know how to pronounce the letters, that will give you the accent. Um, and it's strange how simple it is. Like it is very, very, very phonetic. Like the U always makes the same sound. Um, and so if you can perfect the U, you can perfect whenever you get the U in there, or the A, or whatever else it may be. So a bad accent would be, Buna ziua, ce facets. And then a better one, that one's kind of hard, yeah, but, Buna ziua, ce facets. Craziest foods. First one comes to mind is called piftie. And what, <laughs> I always call it pig face jelly. So what they do, from I've actually seen someone make it, at least I think they were making it. They get a pig's head, and they take all the, every, all the meat that they can off of it, boil it in water with onion and garlic, and then pour it into a container and let it congeal till it's a jelly. And not exactly the best food, but it was definitely a good experience for sure. It's not an American food, let's say that. <laughs> There was one investigator I had actually, we were in the middle of a lesson and he had literally just kicked the Jehovah's Witnesses out um, because they told him that his daughter was, I don't know, that they're gonna have problems. And so when we knocked on the door, he thought we were the Jehovah's Witnesses again. It's like, no, we're the Mormons actually. You had requested us because he'd asked for a Book of Mormon. And so he invited us in, he was a little drunk and um, well, we just had a great time with him. He was pretty funny. Um, older guy. Love him to death. But at one point, he tells us that... I guess you could say I did have a knife pulled on me on my mission. <laughs> he says that he knows why Christ was sentenced to death. It was because in Jewish law, or in Roman law, if you killed someone, you were sentenced to death. And so he takes out a knife and it's like, I have an example here for you. And he comes up to me, and he's shaking this knife, and he's like, if I were to kill you right now, um, I'd be sentenced to death, right? And he's shaking the whole knife at me the whole time. And I understood what he's saying, but my companion was a second transfer companion. He didn't understand the language at all. He saw this knife coming out and was frightened to death. It was kind of funny, but it was completely safe. We had a good time. He invited us over a couple of times, and he actually... Um, we committed him to not drink, at least before the next lesson, like right before so we'd be sober-minded. And he said that he would, or when we met with him again, it's like, haven't touched a drop of alcohol since we met last. And it was like a week later. So that was really awesome to see. Um, this is one, I don't know if anyone actually made it because they made a very good distinction of it in the MTC, but I think someone did at some point. So there's the word um, kopi, which is children, and then kopi, which is copies. So you have to be careful when you're on the street and you don't ask people, oh, where do I make copies? 
and you accidentally say the other word. So uh, luckily, there's another word for copies, and you can say Xerox with Xerox. So that's a safe word to use, but that's a good one that you hear all the time. So first winter in the country, um, it was like completely dry, no snow. Like I got in in January and there was nothing until like halfway through January or end of January. I don't remember when, but it just snowed a ton. There was like two feet of snow. Like there were cars parked on the side of the road and you couldn't tell that they were parked there because there was so much snow covering everything. Um, in some places, like there are definitely poor people and poor members. Um, and there are a lot of times that I chopped wood. And so I had chopped wood before, but once you got some members there, they have a crazy way of doing it. Like normally you think of chopping wood and you take the ax and go all the way down, right? Well, they just take the very, the end of it and this chop super close by, rip it open super fast. I don't know if I can do it that well, but they did it so well that like I can't do it as well as I can, but I'd learned at least the general idea for it. Yeah, like, yeah and just chop right there and just blow it out so fast and you're thinking you're going to chop your hand off. One of the hard things was finding investigators. Because a lot of people aren't terribly open to listening, at least in the ways that I was finding people. There are definitely other ways of doing it. Um, and so it was very difficult sometimes. Um, most people would have multiple weeks on their mission that they wouldn't have any lessons. Um, I can only think of one week that I didn't have any numbers, any key indicators. So that was a bit difficult for me. Um, but most of the times we did have at least one lesson each week. And, but it's, it was very difficult sometimes to find, to find investigators. Um, just because a lot of them are kind of stuck in their ways, unfortunately. I think part of it was my mindset was because a lot of times we'd go out and have not consciously per se, but subconsciously thinking we're not going to find anyone. And so the motivation was kind of down. And so I definitely say go out with more faith. If I would have gone out with more faith and believing a lot more strongly that I could find someone, that I was meant to find someone, um, then I think that the work could have gone a lot better. Okay. The first one that comes to mind... Um, and if there's a couple you want to share, that's totally fine. Yeah. This one's actually kind of personal to me. It was in the MTC, I was having kind of a really hard time because um, I feel like most people do. We had a testimony meeting in which um, everyone was bearing their testimony about Jesus Christ and everyone got the opportunity to, but I didn't, I, I didn't bear my testimony because I saw the strength of their testimonies in Christ and I had a, I had a really hard time. I honestly, I didn't know. I, I was out on a mission and I didn't know. Um, I didn't have a strong enough testimony about Jesus Christ and so there was a time that I like for a couple of weeks at least I considered turning back and not not going out on my mission um, but I prayed hard and like you know you hear all those those people are like yeah and then I had a great spiritual experience that night and it was great I didn't have one of those not that night not the next night um, it took a very long time and that was around Christmas time too well it eventually got better I didn't feel as depressed about it but it was still kind of hard and so come next Christmas time um, I was a district leader in Cluj Napoca great city one of my favorites and um, it was me and my companion two sisters uh, the zone leaders and a senior couple there and so I decided for district meeting right before Christmas we'd have a little nativity thing read through the Luke, um, the Christ's birth, uh, Christ story in Luke, and all the while singing songs that connected to it really well. And so what we did was we acted it out. I was a narrator. The other elders were, um, were the shepherds. Sisters were obviously the angels. <laughs> and the senior couple was, um, was Mary and Joseph. And there was this little 
little toy doll that they had. One of those, you'd lean it over and the eyes close and you'd put it up and the eyes open again. Had markers all over it, the arm was a little disfigured. Um, but they brought the child, you know, they, one of the elder of the senior couple, he, he brought up the child and they said they laid him in a manger and wrapped, wrapped him in swaddling bands. And what he did, I don't know if this was just to be funny, just to be a part of the thing, I don't know what he did it for. But he, he took his scarf off and he wrapped the child in his scarf. And at that moment, uh, I had this realization, this strong realization coming from the spirit that it was, you've known this whole time. You've known he's there. Um, you've known that Jesus is Christ. You've been doing a good job. Keep it up. And the fear, the spirit testified so strongly to me and I could, I felt such great joy. I couldn't, I couldn't talk for a little while because I was crying too hard. <laughs> but I think everyone else felt the spirit in that too. A lot of it comes down to timing and the Lord's will. Because a lot of people didn't see a ton of success on their missions. Well, baptism-wise, they saw success in other ways. Um, but it's what matters is that your heart and your faith is in the right place. And if you're doing what you should, you'll have success in the Lord's eyes. Um, some people you'll see will have tons of baptisms even though they're disobedient or whatnot. Um, it's because they're in the right time, the right place, whatever. But as long as you're doing what you're supposed to, um, the Lord will bless you. You may not, you know, if it's for life, you may not be a billionaire while someone else is, but you will have success, and that's the important part. It's the Lord's success, not necessarily yours. One of the greatest things to do is study and understand what Preach My Gospel is. Um, I know that each of the sections says, okay, my purpose, um, all of, you know, what to study, all that other things. Um, and you think it's obvious what it says, but take a look at it, study what it actually means, and then see how it applies to you. Um, Preach My Gospel is an amazing resource. And in chapter 7, which you use fairly frequently, which is the learning the language, um, Use that not just for learning the language, but also learning the culture. Um, love the people so much. Um, your testimony will be strengthened. Um, there will be doubts. There will be struggles. But the Lord will strengthen you. Um, he will help you to be able to speak the language. When you're a senior companion, you'll understand that um, the Romanians are great people. Um, you'll love them so much. Let, let yourself love them. Even though they may seem a little bit hard on the outside, they're soft on the inside. Um, remember the church is true and that Jesus really does love you. So I don't know if they did this when you were in the MTC, but your um, mission field prep, one of them, uh, they have a guy with a balloon and you know, when and you get a mission call to places like a lot of stateside missions or South America, or like those missions have really high success rates. But in Europe, it's a lot lower um, just because of culture and uh, people are different there. And uh, I remember they they had this balloon and they're like uh, asking people that are going to these supposedly successful missions. They're like, how did you feel when you opened your call? People are like, yeah, you're going to have a great mission. And then, and then he points to a, uh, he has somebody that had a mission call. I think it was to um, uh, Orlando, uh, Scandinavia. I forget what it's called in English. Um, but they bring him up and they're like, so what, what happened when you opened your call? It's like, oh, I was excited. People were happy. And then my, uh, my stake president came up, put his hand on my shoulder and said, you know, it's going to be a really difficult mission. And I don't know where he takes this needle and just pops this balloon right in front of that kid's face, you know, the, the elder's face. And he's like, how did you feel? Like, it felt horrible. And so, like, uh, I kind of had a, a similar, like, experience where some people had kind of 
said, oh, you're not really going to find much. And, and so when I first came in the country, let's actually connect this, um, the night that we came in, there was a baptism. And so we come in, we get our visa work done. Luckily, I was in a small group, so we got it done fast. Nowadays, they change the laws, so it takes like like a day or two, and it's long lines at the visa office. But we got our doctor appointment, visa done really quick. And uh, that night, we went and we saw a baptism, which was cool. Because um, if you hear, you know, your mission doesn't get a lot of success or baptisms, meaning success. And... Um, uh, it was just a neat experience to kind of kick off a mission. Like, first thing you see in your country is that. And um, then after that, we were paired with what we call Nashes. Every Romanian missionary has a Nash. It means a godfather. And so the night um, you come in the country, you don't get your trainer yet. Because our, at least with my mission president, you don't. You uh, He likes to interview you. He considers who he wants for trainers before. And... Um, he announces, you know, who's going to be trainers, but he doesn't like to pair you up with people until after he's interviewed you. And so I'm, I'm assuming that's the same pretty much in every mission. But for that um, little day or so gap between when you come in and when you get your trainer, you stay with uh, another set of missionaries, and one of them is your Nash or your Nasha, godmother or godfather. And uh, I remember my Nash and his companion were not getting along too well. And we show up in the apartment. I got there at like 1.30. And it was almost like, I think it was a quarter to 11 or so when we got back because things had just been delayed. We, we didn't have any public transportation passes. And so we had to like walk and take taxis and things like that. So we got back a little bit late. And uh, I just remember I was starving. I was like, do you guys have any food at all? And there's Romanian food called uh, sarmale. I guess we can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, he had like three sarmale in the fridge. And these were like the small ones, like this big. And there is me and one of my uh, MTC companions. We were a threesome in the MTC. <laughs> They'd been in the fridge too long. They were cold. I was starving. I ate it. I was like, this is disgusting. And... It was just a horrifying experience, and wake up in the morning still starving. We didn't eat breakfast, of course, because uh, I didn't know, know this at the time, but they were taking us to the mission president's house, and we were going to have breakfast there with them. But I was clueless to that, so I was like, man, I'm hungry. Like, this is terrible. I had two little tiny cabbage rolls that were frozen, and just, uh, but, um, so I'm walking down the street, and there's a little thing called a gogo sherie, and it means like a donut shop, but it's more like uh, fry bread. And then they put all kinds of like jams or chocolate things in it. And I was like, okay. Was, I, I stopped the group. I was like, guys, I'm hungry. I'm getting one of these. <laughs> so I got it. It was delicious. It was the, the first Romanian street food I'd ever had, and it was incredible. Partially due to extreme hungry hunger, and then the other part due to like, it's just a really good thing. See, it's just it's delicious. Um, and then a little further on in the day, uh, <laughs> so we're driving around with the APs um, the day before, and they're talking about the trainers. And they're like, oh, there's this one trainer, you know, and uh, he's great, like really hardworking, you know, just always smiling. Everybody loves him, happy, happy go lucky guy, okay? And we knew there was three trainers, so there's one. I was like, okay, I could go with that guy. And they're like, oh, the second one, man, he is just crazy. Like, he's the funnest guy to be around, works really hard. And I was like, you know, I like zany humor. I could totally go for that. You know, like, that'd be a cool, cool trainer. And then, like, uh, we get to the visa office the day before, you know, we're driving around. And we get out, and there's no comment on the third trainer. I was like, I don't want to be with that guy. Like, the APs don't have anything good to say about him. I don't want to be with that guy. And uh, so, of course, the next day I found out I'm with that guy. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that they just forgot to say anything about him because they were getting out of the van because, like, he was the coolest trainer ever. But I was just, at first, I was like, I do not want this guy. Because every missionary, I think, goes into the mission field with some kind of complex of, like, I'm going to fix this mission. It's it's me, like, some kind of pride problem or something. Like, you know, I can, I can change this mission. And... Uh, 
when I heard that about my trainer and I, I saw him and things like that, I was just like, you know, I have to fix this guy. Yeah, because I've been a missionary so long, I can fix this guy, right? Anyway, so coming in the country, that's what happened. My first area I was assigned to an eastern part, east northeast part of uh, Bucharest. It's called Obor. It's an incredible place. Uh, your apartment is one of like 10 communist blocks that are attached together. And then there's a huge um, agricultural market called a piazza right next to it. And so it's a great place to start. Lots of people and fun area. Right? So remaining culture, there's two things you need to know right off the bat. First is communism fell like 20 years ago, but you're still going to notice it. Um, everything's built out of concrete. Everything. So that common image that you get of like communist Russia, like massive apartment complexes built out of concrete. Yeah, you live in those. You, that's where you do your tracting. Um, and they're they're not that bad. So like they they don't have that bad of a a rep that they kind of people talk about. Uh, the second thing you need to know is the Orthodox Church. Um, it's like paramount in their culture. I know in other countries you hear about like the Catholic Church being super predominant and like controlling a lot of things. Uh, I would, uh, kind of sounds like arrogant, but I would say the Orthodox Church has a much stronger grip on the culture and, and the people in Romania. They hold really strong to their tradition. They believe that Andrew um, came and brought them the gospel and that they've had the church since. So they got their roots like from one of the twelve. So they stick to it. Um, but because of that, a lot of their culture reflects around both these things. So you kind of have the conflicting ideals of when communism said no, no to religion. And then when it was released, people got their religion back. And so they stick to it a lot stronger. They don't want people taking it away. And so I'd say probably 99% of people you run into are going to be orthodox. And they'll say, I was the, the classic line you hear, I was born orthodox family's orthodox and I'll die orthodox um, but it's actually it's a good faith and they actually keep it for for a fairly good portion of the population so as far as culture goes um, there's a kind of rift in generations the older generation you'll see a lot of um, the thought process rotates around the, the communism but um, and the younger generation is more like free and kind of um, ecstatic and more uh, we, we use a word called schmecker and it means kind of like a smart aleck but it's because there's these like conflicting there's like a rift between their uh their history and these generations right now other facts about culture is uh romanians care a lot about their family um i didn't think that i always thought the family was kind of a strong focus in the u.s and then when uh, I went to Romania, like, family is number one to them. In the United States, you know, you grow old, you get older, you become an adult, you, you leave home, you go make a family, and like, or you establish a family, and you move away from your parents, kind of. In Romania, you stick close to your family. A lot of times, like, even after you're married, you'll, you'll stay with your parents, just or they'll move in with you, and, you know, you don't separate. Um... They stay pretty close together in family. They really value that. Um, if you're worried about like walking on the streets and doing missionary work, or uh, even just being like a tourist or something, Romania has very low levels of violence. Um, I was never threatened while doing my missionary work. Um, while I was there, I heard of two stories, and they were almost provoked. And so, like, uh, if you're just smart about, like, don't be out too late after dark or don't go in sketchy areas, there's, like, really nothing you need to worry about. Oh, do's or don'ts. Yeah, there's uh, just one thing. Um, use a lot of public transportation. People are always out. As Americans in public, we're really boisterous and loud. And so you'll hop on to, like, um, a metro or a subway. And, you know, if you're with the... Um, a couple of the missionaries, you'll be talking and everybody will be quiet and just look at you because like, you know, it's just, uh, I think if you're from the East part of this country, like you'll understand a little bit better cause it's a little bit more like that, but we're so used to just being, 
uh, free and like uh, in social social perspective, like you speak all the time. And uh, so kind of a don't is um, just don't be kind of like a public nuisance. I know that sounds interesting because you're supposed to be a missionary, like, and follow the rules and be representative of Jesus Christ. But uh, a lot of times, like, being, uh, having too much uh, laughter or being too loud in public, it's, um, they kind of look down on that a little bit. So, like, be yourself, enjoy that, and be happy, but also be kind of conscious of, like, uh, when you're being kind of, like, noisy. If you notice everybody's staring at you on the tram by, that's there's probably a reason for that. So maybe you could tone it down or not laugh so incredibly loud or something. So in the mission field um, in Romania, there are no stakes yet. Um, everything is still a branch. Um, a little bit about the history of it. It got dedicated in 1993, which is cool. See, I was born, um, and. Uh, Elder Nelson in the Karma 12 is the one that dedicated it. And there's a lot of speculation as, a, as to like church history before it. It's um, really closely tied with some of the Hungarian church history because, you know, they're next door neighbors and Hungary used to uh, extend like half of Romania. Um, but it started off pretty well. It kicked off, you know, from Bucharest and kind of expanded outward. Uh, as far as like the intermittent history, I don't know much about, um, but uh, Romania was actually pretty close, I think, to having a stake in like 2007 or so. Um, but what happened is Romania is a post-communist country, and uh, as far as Europe goes, they're not very, you know, financially prosperous compared to like France or Italy or other places. And so, um, I forget the year that they joined the European Union, but um, when they joined the European Union, there were six branches or so of like 40 people in Bucharest, and so, like pretty much enough to establish a small stake. And um, they joined the EU, and the membership just dropped, and they all left. Um, and so, there's kind of a reset button hit on Romania, it was really interesting. You can look at a lot of um, the first few transfers of my mission. I did a lot of less active work trying to find people. And so many of them are just, they've moved, they're gone. Um, just took off to other countries for better opportunities. And so um, right now the in Bucharest, the main city, there's two branches. There's one in Mihai Bravu, which is Michael the Brave. And then Pandur, which is like it means guards or something. It's a form of guard, but, um, one's on the east side and the other's on the west. And there's chapels in both those areas. Um, the attendance varies anywhere from 30 to 60 people a week. And, um, the Pondwood branch has a lot more like internationals, more English speakers. There's, um, I believe there's a few people from Asia and other countries as well. So, um, as far as the rest of the country, the branches are typically pretty small, 20 to 30 members. Um, for about six months of my mission, I, um, I served in a town called Baco. I didn't know it at the time, but I guess it was known as the armpit of the mission. And uh, I got sent there after training, and I was told I had to be branch president. And I was just barely 20 years old, and... If you've ever been told something like that, you're just like, I have no idea how to do this. My companion had been in that area for a while and was pretty anxious to get out because he had spent the winter. And at the time, there were only like six active members that came, um, or six members a week that came. They kind of alternated on who came. Uh, and so it was a tough area. That's that. And there's a couple other cities that like really struggle um, and have really low attendance. But um, mostly due to that thing I mentioned, a lot of people left the European Union or people move a lot. And so we don't have uh, church presence or missionaries in a lot of areas. And so I think there's only like 16 areas or somewhere around that. And so 
if you consider that we don't have a huge presence in Romania right now. There's about, um, I think there's somewhere around 3,000 members on lists, but active each week, I think in the whole country, there's six to 800 at the most, at least when I was there. Um, and so there's that. Uh, as far as the languages go, uh, almost all of Romania speaks entirely Romanian everything. If you get more towards the east or in the Transylvania area, those are, Transylvania is like around the mountains. Um, you know, everybody thinks Dracula and stuff, but uh, there's two cities. There's uh, Brasov and Sibiu, and uh, anything kind of northeast of that, uh, you're going to have a very high population of um, Hungarian speakers. Uh, I served in an area called Aradia, and the branch there is phenomenal. Half the half the members are returned missionaries, which is kind of a good and bad thing because if you're trying to do missionary work, you're getting told how to do it from like eight different perspectives and mission types, and just anyway, it was interesting. But um, so um, when I was in that city, I I started studying a little bit of Hungarian because I'd been there, been in the country for a while, because. Um, in that city you go and there's like half Hungarian, half Romanian and uh, it's kind of hush hush but there's well over 50% like native Hungarian speakers. Everybody there speaks Romanian but uh, there's a huge amount of Hungarian speaking. Uh, if you head more towards the east part of the country and get closer to Moldova you'll run into a Russian speaker here and there but it's still mostly Romanian. But Moldova itself is like split down the middle not geographically, but um, you have a lot of Russian speakers and a lot of Romanian speakers. Uh, a lot of people speak both, but um, each person kind of has their preference, and so there's both kinds of missionaries up there. And um, uh, it was definitely interesting. I had a companion from Moldova. He's one of the hardest working guys in the mission. Just uh, it was funny. He really got motivated to like do self improvement and things like that. So uh, he was a great role model. He's actually uh, the guy that trained me to to be branch president. So that was that was fun. I love Romanian food. I have very rarely had any bad Romanian food, and it was all just phenomenal. Um, they kind of have like two sides of their food. There's a whole bunch of like street type of food. You know, that you're going to get out of vendors and like their traditional food. Um, start off with the street food because I just, I love the street food. There's a thing called shawarma. If anybody uh, like serves around uh, Turkey or hung uh, Hungary and stuff, they're going to have thing. It's called kebab in other places. But um, they take a tortilla type thing. They put french fries in it. Oh my gosh. And then uh, they have like a meat shaver. They have a little spit rotating. It's like a vertical spit. And they either do like shaved chicken or shaved beef or like euro meat, depends on the place. And they put all kinds of sauces and veggies and oh my gosh, phenomenal, fantastic. And they're like pretty cheap. My last area, uh, Alexandria, it's like south of Bucharest. We, uh, <laughs> I'd been cooking my whole mission. Like uh, we don't get fed a lot over there. So like you cook most of your own food. And so I was kind of exhausted of cooking my own food. And we had been switching apartments and moving and stuff made transfer and so it was obnoxious to do that anyway. And so I got a shower about like, I'd say probably four times a week that transfer, which wasn't too healthy on my, you know, but it was delicious and fantastic. There's all kinds of other street foods, but uh, as far as traditional food goes, they eat a lot of pickled stuff. So it's been like uh, soaked and, you know, just pickled stuff, cabbage and veggies. Um, if you're not used to pickled things, it's, it takes a while to get used to, but they're actually really, like, the homemade pickled foods. They do a lot of vegetables. They're really health conscious, uh, which kind of contradicts me eating all that street food. But they're really health conscious about the foods that they eat. Um, the first traditional food you need to know about is sarmale. Um, one is called a sarma. And um, what they are is you take a pickled cabbage leaf, or it could be a grapevine leaf, just some kind of pickled green leaf, 
and you cook rice and some kind of meat together and you put spices in it you wrap it up and then uh, you can either some people boil them in like um, we call it red sauce just some kind of tomato sauce or you can like bake them in that but um, basically they're just these little bite-sized things of delicious goodness like those uh, sotomale I had on the first day were not a good representation at all of what they were I love sotomale uh, we're gonna be doing a Christmas party and like the only thing everyone wants is sotomale and so that's like um, one of their main entrees they do de un plutz, which are like stuffed peppers kind of the same thing but they use bell peppers um, okay they eat bread with everything so if you have a bowl of soup you eat a loaf of bread with it if you have sotomale you, you eat a bowl of bread with it if you have a salad uh, you eat a, a thing of bread with it you know if you eat a loaf of bread you gotta have a side of bread with it but it's good because the bread there is fantastic you pay like 50 American cents at the most for like the most extravagant loaf of bread you'll ever have in your life. Uh, just really good, tasty, and anyway, if you don't eat bread in Romania, you're missing out. So, um, but because they eat so much bread, they have they have things they call salate. It means it translates to salad, but it's not the salad we think of where you have like yeah we got leaves and maybe some beans or pineapple or bacon bits. Let's find the bacon bits and not really eat the lettuce. Now, uh, salate are um, kind of like bread spreads almost um, and there's a couple kinds there's an eggplant one that I really enjoy it's called salate de vinete it's brown and it has kind of um, it almost has like a barbecued uh, aspect to the flavor but uh, it's just a really savory flavor uh, my favorite was salate boeuf and there's a lot of question on how you actually pronounce that because it's not a Romanian word but um, it has a bunch of different types of veggies, a little bit of mustard and mayo. Sounds kind of gross, like, why would you put that on bread? But, like, fantastic. It's delicious. Um, yeah, and all, kind of, all kinds of bread spreads. Uh, they have two kinds of soup. One's called chorba and the other's called supa, of course. The supas are just like you expected things, like, yeah, like a chicken noodle or maybe, like, uh, they don't eat a lot of beef. They eat a lot of pork, so, like, a beef potato or pork potato, something like that. But what you really got to try is the chorba. Okay. Uh, a chorba, what makes it different from a soup is it has a thing called borscht in it. Um, borscht, they take uh, wheat tares and they ferment them, non-alcoholically, mind you, um, in water. And so it kind of, uh, this might sound a little bad, it kind of adds the taste of like what you might have in a beer or something, but to a soup. Uh, don't worry, no alcohol content, like, uh, they save the alcohol for, for drinking, not for eating, so, um, but you put that in the soup, and it has, like, a really, kind of a, a sour or bitter taste to it, and it just amplifies the flavor, so, you'll see a lot of different types of soups, the broths are going to be a lot different than you're used to in the States, but, uh, if I had to rate them, I'd, I'd rather have um, a chorba than soup from Olive Garden or anywhere else in, in the country here, so, yeah, that's pretty much all the food. Oh, desserts, okay, so desserts are a little bit interesting, um, as Americans we're so used to like high sugar and like high fat and cream flavors, and um, so there's these things called cofetterie where like they have all these really fancy looking like cake bits and all kinds of desserts, all these, they look fantastic, just artistic, beautiful. And when you get it, like, uh, there's two things you're going to notice. One, there's not the sugar you're used to, and so you're going to go, this isn't flavorful. And the second is you're going to go, this tastes like rum. I uh, need to explain that a little bit. There's um, a rum flavoring that they use, uh, Senso de Rome. Roma, excuse me, uh, but they uh, <laughs> they love adding that, and so you have to be careful because the the rum essence has no alcohol in it; it's just the flavor. But sometimes they put real rum in, and so you kind of have to like be able to tell which one's which. Um, and because they don't use like a, as much sodium and other preservatives that we use, of course they use alcohol as a type of preservative. 
And so sometimes if you buy like a really cheap packaged little bits of cake, um, it might smell and taste a little bit like fingernail polish to you because they use that preservative and it doesn't make it not tasty, it just makes it something that you're not used to. Uh, it took me a while to get used to them, but after that, like, I, I really grew to love the, the pastries and the cakes and, oh my gosh, the go-gosh. The go-gosh, I already talked about those, the little fried breads. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the majority of what you're going to find food-wise. Oh, drinks. Uh, they have a thing called nectar. So... <laughs> Uh, they call any, like, basically any drink that's not water, they call souk, unless it has, like, alcohol in it. And so there's uh, there's all kinds of juices. We think of juice like, okay, Welch's, you know, it's got this percent juice content and then this. No, they have, like, really exotic ways of making souk. There's, uh, there's like, carbonated orange juices and carbonated carrot juices I've seen a couple times. But my favorite um, type of souk, it's called nectar. And it's, the first time I had it was at the Mission President's house when we had that breakfast. And we had a peach nectar. And, you know, you hear the word nectar and you think instantly like uh, the Testament, like the nectar of the gods. And uh, like I drank that and I was like, this is what that is. And it's just, it's a lot thicker. So a lot, it's like super rich. The flavor is potent. You take a drink of it, and it's like taking a bite into the freshest, most ripe form of the fruit that you've ever come across. And every single glass is like that. It's just fantastic. It's got a ton of sugar in it. Uh, as far as I know, we had we had a missionary that developed diabetes, and uh, most of us assume it was because of his diet. He consumed a huge amount of souk and ate like all kinds of street foods and stuff like that. And to, add, to boot, he didn't like really exercise, but there is that potential, but it's all delicious food, you know, all things in moderation. Um, one food you do need to know about, okay? And it's, it's interesting, you're gonna hear a lot of conflicted opinions about it. Um, it's called piftier. Uh, there's a couple of different names for it throughout the country. So let me describe it real quick. So for uh, Christmas, they have big meals, right? They say, Anteyatun uh, pork. They butchered a pig. Or they had, you know, they bought a pig and got a bunch of meat. And they do kind of a feast. They have tons of courses and things like that. PFDA is where they take the fat and the leftover parts from that pig. And they make like a gelatin mix. And so your PFDA is going to have like uh, bits of skin or ear or nose or who knows what in it. And then it's in this like, gr almost like a grayish jello looking thing, but a little bit more consistent. And uh, so of course you, you hear that and you go, that sounds horrible. And um, I only had it once. And I didn't know until after the fact that it was actually PFDA. And it was a turkey PFDA. Um, so you know how when you get gravy after your Thanksgiving, and you put it in the fridge, it kind of like congeals and it's really thick and stuff. So it was a lot like that and then turkey bits were baked with it and so like there were slices of that. And when I, it, it was served cold, of course, but um, when I ate it, it was actually incredibly tasty. It had a good balance of like uh, garlic and spices in it. Um, the day before, um, the other missionaries um, had been fed some and they said it wasn't too great. But we went to the same member's house the next day, and we had the same stuff, and it was just, it was phenomenal. So, as far as PFDA goes, it's kind of, I think it's kind of, you got to toss a coin and see if it's going to be incredibly good or not so much. It depends on uh, how much you've kind of adapted to the food. So, the Romanian language is, believe it or not, a romance language. It's... Um, I've heard it said that it's the hardest romance language to learn. I think grammar-wise, yes, but if you're thinking pronunciation, um, French is going to be the worst. But um, uh, Romanian, its word base is kind of interesting. It's like 77% uh, derived straight from Latin. So like it's the closest living language to Latin, quote unquote, because they keep so much of the so many of the words and the grammar structure of it. Um, 
but the other portion of the language is going to draw from ancient Slavic words and then um, a little bit of Hungarian and then the original Dacian language. Romania was called Dacia. If you look on the Bible map in the Book of Mormon, or not the Book of Mormon, in the, the Bible, in the Bible map, uh, there's a country called Dacia on one of those maps, and that's Romania. And so that's kind of the origin of, of the language. They used to write with the Cyrillic alphabet like hundreds of years ago. And then uh, they went through a French uh, kind of, not renaissance, like they wanted to mimic a little bit of French culture and a lot of people were learning French. And so a lot of their Slavic influences kind of uh, passed away and in came this huge influx of French influenced Latin um, into the language. And so you'll see if you know a word in English that has its root in French, I guarantee it's going to be almost exactly the same in Romanian. Um, like one of the words for foundation, okay, foundation, fundatie, like it's almost exactly the same, just change a couple of things here and there. Um, and so if you're wondering how to say something and you don't know a word, you can always guess and try and go with like a fancy French word. If it ends with shun in English, usually it's like a tsi or a tsune. So as far as like learning words, um, uh, you're going to have both an easy and a hard time. The pronunciation, everything is exactly phonetic. I know a lot of languages say that, like in Spanish, they say it's precisely phonetic, but it's not. You have a silent H and a couple letters that mimic the sound of each other. Romanian is, every single sound is always pronounced. There's nothing that isn't. Um, the only exception is when you pluralize things. Uh, and it has an I at the end, you just, instead of saying E, it goes like a, or like it is just different pronunciation on that, but it's still pronounced. So everything is precisely phonetic. Um, it's a case language. It's one of the easier case languages. Um, what a case language means is that a word will change its, its form depending on its part of, or its function in speech. And so you've got like six or seven cases and then a couple moods and voices. Uh, what that basically means is like there's a difference between um, uh, saying he loves her and then he gave a package to her. So like you have one there that's accusing and then the other would be dative. Like direct and indirect, those are your cases. And then you have a couple things that you're going to run into like genitive, um, and voices, there's interesting things like passive, there's supine mood. Um, so the grammar, there's plenty of grammar to learn. Um, if you understand your own grammar first, like if you know English grammar fairly well and you know how to use it correctly, learning the, the grammar of the language shouldn't be too difficult. Um, but a couple features that make it unique as opposed to a lot of other Romance languages, like Italian, it doesn't pluralize with an S. It pluralizes by changing the vowel at the end or by adding a vowel. Um, except Romanian's got a lot more ways of doing it. It has an additional gender for words, and um, it's a lot more irregular. And so, like, you have masculine, which usually pluralizes, well, masculine always pluralizes with an I. Feminine, usually there's some kind of E added to it, or sometimes it adds an I or sometimes you add this little thing called ur at the end of it. As far as the way they use language, it's a lot different. They use a lot of, uh, I guess you'd say salutations in English. So in English, if somebody says, oh, I have um, three kids, you say, okay, that's nice. In Romanian, there's a phrase you say after that, like it's sabotrayaska. If um, you say, oh, such and such just passed away. In English, you say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that in Romanian. It translates like, uh, may the Lord forgive them or something like that. And like there are phrases you say depending on like when somebody tells you something. And so it's a, in a way it's a lot more formal. You address people as your Lordship or um, uh, kind of like a more formal way of saying ma'am. And um, there's, a, it's just a lot formal. There's, um, you might feel like when you first learn it, there's a lot less ability to express yourself, but you'll see there's a beauty in the language where um, you have ways to respond to things that you can't in English. Um, there are 
their key phrases you say after you hear things. And so that's kind of an interesting component of the language. The structure of a prayer in Romanian, as you might expect, is almost exactly the same as it, in, is, as it is in English. Um, the only difference is we don't use thou and thine and stuff in Romanian. Use the word for you. So it's a lot more, um, I don't know, it's, it's, they always say talk to Heavenly Father like he's your, your real dad. And so it's a little bit easier to do that in Romanian. So you always start out by addressing Heavenly Father. You say draga, tata, ceresc. And that's dear, father, heavenly. So, um, and then you want to say thank you. So you want to say uts mul tu mim. So uh, all together it's uts mul tu mim. That means to you we give thanks or thank you. And then you follow with pentru, which is for, and whatever you want to say after that. So um, if you want to say the opportunity to serve a mission, opportunitatea de a sluji o misiune. Um, the way you ask for blessings is you say um, te rugam. So te is you, and then rugam, we ask. Um, and you follow by sa, which means to. So we ask you to, and then you follow with what you want to say. So if you want to say to, let's say a meal prayer, say, uh, please bless this food. You say, te rugam sa bine cuvântez. That's a big word for you bless. Achasta mancare. So bless this food. Um, and so that's the basic structure. The way you close is, um, of course, you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And you say, în numele lui Isus Christos, amen. And so that's your basic structure for a prayer. And um, you just look up words and add things on as you go, as you learn, and kind of understand somebody when they pray a little bit in Romanian, know at least when they're saying thank you and please bless us. What was one of the craziest foods you had in Romania? Um, we uh, had this soup. It was a cream-based soup with like spinach in it and some other kind of interest. No, okay, take it back, sorry. Uh, cow stomach soup. Believe it or not, pretty delicious. Uh, yeah. What is one of the craziest or most dangerous experiences you had? Um, the dogs. There are stray dogs everywhere. And so uh, I've been chased a couple times. Uh, one time we were on a hike and this rabid dog attacked us. So there's that one. What is one of the most spiritual experiences you had? Um, I found an investigator in my third transfer from uh, an Islamic country. And uh, it's hard to find investigators there. And the first thing that happened is we handed him a little English flyer. And he said, this is cool, but I want to learn about Jesus. Because I had heard about this guy that teaches uh, using love and example rather than the sword. And so we taught him. He went from knowing zero about Jesus Christ to after three months of teaching him. And I know that sounds like slow progression, but in Romania, that's good. Uh, he was able to answer almost all the baptismal questions like with an affirmative and strong testimony. Um, any language mistakes you made? Um, everybody makes them. I can't remember anything super embarrassing at the moment. Most common is just mixing up conjugations because there's two ways to conjugate almost any type of verb. And so just mixing things up with that. Greatest life lesson you learned on your mission? <sighs> Learning to love people that may not necessarily love you. Best skill you gained as a missionary? Um, best skill. I would have to say making each day count for something. Um, and knowing that it's a choice that's yours, that you can choose to make that day productive or not. Craziest weather? Oh my goodness, craziest weather. Um... I didn't face the worst of it, but one day, uh, it was P-Day, and a blizzard hit Bucharest. I wasn't there, luckily. I was in the warmest part of the country for both winters. But this, like, shut people inside. And on your P-Day, like, that's the worst thing ever to have. Just, uh. One of the hardest things you went through? 
Um, being branch president over a small group of people and wondering if the branch is going to be there in the future. Um, it turned it turned out good in the end. The branch has grown a lot, but at the moment, it it really concerns you and makes you feel like your efforts are in vain. But it's it's really gone into fruition now. Best piece of mission prep advice you could give? Um, don't go out with unless you have your testimony, and don't go out unless you want to. Um, don't let family pressure tell you to go out. You. Go out when you're ready. Go out when you've resolved problems in your life. Don't, don't go because it's expected of you. Just go when you're ready and when the Lord says you're ready. Best advice you could give for someone just getting home from the mission? Um, it was a fantastic experience, but believe it or not, not everybody wants to hear about it. So uh, anything that you loved about your mission, review often in your journal, but learn to uh, adapt to this life as well. When you first open your mission call, you get a whole bunch of advice from former missionaries and from people who, of course, have never served and who, out of good intention, want to tell you how to be a good missionary. Um, I think the most influential advice I ever received out of the cornucopia of things was learn to love the people. Um, in my own experience, uh, I didn't understand what that meant until I got in the field. Um, you really do have to learn to love people. When I first got in the mission, um, I was so eager and excited to do the work, and uh, I I wanted to follow that advice, like love the people. And um, my trainer pulled me aside one day and said, uh, "You don't love the people," and I was like. You can't tell me I don't love the people. Like, I gave up my life for two years. I gave up everything. I could be done with my bachelor's degree by now. I could be this or that. And uh, I was just really defensive about it. Like, you can't tell me I don't love them. And he said, no, like, you want to love them, but you can't, you, you can't love them yet. You don't know them. You don't know their trials. You don't know their history. When somebody rejects you and says no to um, an invitation you've given, prompted by the Spirit, it hurts. And the first thing you're going to want to do is justify and say, well, I don't have to love that person. And uh, it's really natural to feel that way. And um, a, lot of, a lot of bitterness can develop. But as you learn more about uh, the hardships that uh, your mission people have gone through, and um, I know it sounds cheesy, but see them as Christ would see them. You really learn how to love them. Um, it's not something you can just switch on and off like it's like it's a light. Uh, it's something that grows. And as you grow to love your mission people, uh, you may not see your success rate change because that all depends on the Lord. Um, but you will definitely see a different. Uh, type of blessing you will see the the guidance that you're given to talk to people in greater abundance and you'll see the effect of your testimony a lot stronger on the lives of people so I would definitely say um, love the mission people but learn to love them